So now the official welcome to the collaboration between Aesthetics for Birds and the Southern Aesthetics Workshop. We have four speakers today. Each session will last about half an hour. So the speakers will have 15 minutes for their presentations and we'll have 15 minutes for Q&A. You can write your questions for the speakers at any time during the chat. And after their official presentation, uh, our question master, Aaron Meskin, will start asking those questions of our speakers. Um, so without further ado, so we keep to time, I would like to welcome our first speaker who is Craig Agul. And he is from Rutgers University Camden. His talk today is titled Robust Moderate Moralism. Uh, thanks so much for having me here. I'm super excited to, uh, to get feedback from you all. So I'm normally, I, I work in uh, moral responsibility and crim law theory, blame stuff. So really what I'm trying to do is use some of my thinking about blame to dip my toes into the aesthetics literature. And my concern is to defend people who, uh, who think that their moral squeamishness about a work of art uh, actually makes the art ugly, right? So I'm defending aesthetic moralism. Uh, and at least in this talk, I'm primarily concerned with squeamishness because of the content of the work, as opposed to say squeamishness because of the audience's background or the artist's background. Uh, and this is, very much a working paper. I'm looking forward to your comments. So digging in. I'm going to assume uh, familiarity with autonomism and foundationalism. And uh, when I say I'm going to assume that, I mean both uh, your all familiarity and my own familiarity. I'm going to assume that I'm at least somewhere in the neighborhood of, of what these, uh, these positions claim. So uh, but when I started reading about the moderate moralists, I saw you know, a slightly different accounts being sold as moderate moralism. So I thought I should say what I'm taking moderate moralism to be. And so for me, moderate moralism says something like this. Aesthetics sets its own standards for success, whatever they are. So moderate moralism is agnostic to what counts as uh, beauty and ugly and the rest. Um, but it does claim that moral matters can affect whether those standard, those intrinsic standards are met. So that's the moderateness, the moral matters, but only moderately so, there's no insistence upon intrinsic value. Uh, so then um, uh, when I start thinking about moderate moralism at work, uh, I wanna focus on works of art, especially representational works of art, where aesthetic success is tied to uh, the fittingness of certain audience responses. So uh, uh, comedy is aesthetically successful among other, uh, in among other fashions when it is fitting to laugh at, when the comedy is such that laughter is fitting. In a scary movie, aesthetically successful uh, when it is fitting, the content is such that it's fitting to fear. Uh, and because these are genre defining aims, the failure to be properly aimed at them is a genre failure and thus an aesthetic failure. So I'm thinking about the works with those kinds of aims. And in my reading, I saw uh, sometimes these two kinds, the fitting and the occluding of modern moralism uh, uh, are sort of pushed together, but I wanna split them apart a little bit. So fitting moderate moralism, uh, here I think of Noel Carroll's famous tragedy example, uh, so uh, imagine that I read a tragedy where the author has mistakenly made the protagonist too bad. Uh, in that case, the right or the fitting response to the tragedy might be righteous pleasure. And uh, insofar as tragedy is aimed at eliciting pity, uh, and this tragedy elicits, correctly elicits righteous pleasure, the, uh, the work has failed to uh, measure up to the standards of, of tragedy, and so it's an aesthetic failure, at least in that regard. So uh, I am, this seems right to me, uh, uh, I'm convinced, but it seems limited to certain genres and even within those genres to certain moral failures. So in the tragedy, if along the way, just as side stories, there's a lot of other reprehensible bad behavior by other characters, it still might be fitting to pity the protagonist for their downfall. And so those other moral uh, matters don't seem to bear on the fittingness of pity. So 
then, uh, so that's fitting moderate moralism. Moral matters directly affect whether pity or, or fear is, is fitting to the, the uh, right, directly affect whether pity or fear is fitting. In occluding moderate moralism, uh, here, this is broader, occluding moderate moralism claims that an audience's morally appropriate reaction might get in the way of the aimed for aesthetic response. So Carroll makes, I take it, this argument about American Psycho, uh, that American Psycho with its deadpan depictions of violence, a decent audience reading American Psycho uh, will react to those deadpan depictions of violence and they'll be kind of engrossed or you know, maybe even repulsed by. The reaction will uh, be to those deadpan depictions of violence. And because those reactions occupy them, they miss the satire. So the reaction to the violence occludes the fittingness of the satire. Uh, uh, this argument is no longer limited to certain genres in the way that fitting moderate moralism is, because it just doesn't matter what the fitting response to the, the, the sort of limited fitting response is, the, uh, the distraction of the moral matters can get in the way of anything. So this is broader than fitting moderate moralism, but it runs into a problem, uh, I think a number of people have raised, but I think is best captured maybe, or at least in my reading so far by Daniel Jacobson. So uh, we can suppose that, suppose it's true that the morally good reader, the both morally good and aesthetically skilled reader of American Psycho should not have the aesthetic response of appreciating satire. Suppose it's true that the kind of best overall read of American Psycho is one that is kind of so repulsed by the violence as to not engage the satire. We can't infer from that, says Jacobson, from the kind of best response all things considered is not to react to the satire, that satire is not fitting. Uh, so so the, uh, the, the all things considered judgment doesn't give us grounds for the aesthetic judgment. So then the morally right, the morally good audience might get the right result in a sense, but only because their morally good reaction obscures the aesthetic truth from them. And so this was the thing that I started off my talk saying, um, I, I, the, the kind of comment that I'm worried about, that, uh, that morally good arguments are sort of missing the aesthetic truth because of their morally good audiences are missing the aesthetic truth because of their moral goodness. So fitting moral, moderate moralism is plainly aesthetic, but too narrow, while occluding moderate moralism is plenty broad, but plausibly no longer an aesthetic conclusion. So that's where I want to try to uh, rehabilitate occluding moderate moralism. Uh, and so here's my uh, little three premise arguments. So first, uh, moral reactions are aesthetically appropriate reactions to moral content, uh, to aesthetic content. Uh, uh, so thinking about works of representational art, they often direct us to consider morally freighted content. And often, uh, perhaps virtually always, we should approach art open to reacting to its content. So uh, uh, here, what do I mean? You know, representational art might have us uh, uh, consider the, the badness of the protagonist's downfall in a tragedy. So it's having us take up and consider, you know, you've missed out on the, the point of the tragedy if you don't appreciate that the downfall was a downfall, if you just think that's another thing that happened. So you have to at least consider that content and see the kind of uh, the, the, the bad value in it. Uh, and, you know, you should approach art often uh, being open to reacting to the content. So, you know, if you're gonna watch a scary movie you're not, you're not engaging it correctly if you engage it only in order to say dispassionately judge that it was scary. You've got to engage it open to being scared. Uh, and so, you know, uh, moral reactions are no different. So uh, moral reactions are therefore not just appropriate reactions, but they're aesthetically appropriate reactions. So uh, great, that's premise one. Premise two, uh, moral reactions uh, have essential or constitutive perceptual and interpretive elements. And here I'm going to limit this claim for now to uh, the blame reactions, reactions to wrongdoing. So indignation, resentment, guilt, maybe even shame. Uh, and I'm taking this claim from my own work uh, on, on, on 
kind of blame and moral responsibility and from work in progress and work from others on forgiveness. That for the reactive attitudes, for the attitudes of blame and the rest, we blame in significant part by seeing the other in the light of their wrongdoing. So I'll tell my students, imagine the police procedural and the lamp you know, during the interrogation. And one of the things the lamp and the director uh, are doing is showing you the badness of the suspect. And I think that's uh, often what blame, what blame does. When we blame someone, our blame is directing our attention. Our blame has us notice evidence of culpability, of harm, of maliciousness. So our blame just is in part the way we pay attention to the wrongdoer. And not only do we notice evidence of culpability, but we are correspondingly less sensitive to evidence of exculpation. Right? Uh, and likewise for interpretations. Once I'm in the thick of blame, the same evidence is going to be more significant of culpability and less significant of exculpability for me. Uh, and I think this, uh, this view of blame, that it has essential perceptual uh, and interpretive elements, explains why blame is so sticky, why it's so hard once you're angry and resentful to walk away even in the face of perhaps conflicting evidence. This is blame's epistemic impenetrability. Uh, and then uh, I think this also explains blame sprawl, that uh, the, uh, everyone else in this room is better than me, but if I'm angry at you, once I'm angry about this thing, I'm gonna notice everything else bad about you. So when I read your paper about uh, defending aesthetic autonomism and I get angry, I'm, that anger is gonna help me notice that you're a double spacer after periods or whatever it is. So blame sprawls like that because of the way it corrals our attention and interpretations. So that's the second premise. Uh, uh, I'm not laughing at the comments. Uh, so uh, the third premise, uh, once we've got these perceptual and interpretive reactions, we can say that they're gonna make for aesthetic demerits when they're poorly fit with other elements of the work and merits when they're well fit. So uh, here's two quick examples outside of a representational art. Imagine a musical piece with a soft, complex piano progression and imagine that you as the producer overlay that soft complex piano progression with a shill, shrill constant alarm noise, so loud and so shrill that no reasonable audience can even hear the piano progression. Arguably, those, your reaction to the, uh, the shrill noise makes for an aesthetic demerit because it just occludes your perception of the piano progression. Or uh, you know, a, a visual example, imagine a carefully curated newspaper collage, and then just surround it with exceedingly bright white LED lights, such that no one with human eyes can see the collage. I suppose in some sense there might be, that, there might be some aesthetic virtue in the conceptual work, but just as a visual work, it doesn't matter that the collage is carefully curated anymore because the appropriate reaction, the appropriate aesthetic reaction to the light occludes perceiving the collage at all. Uh, so, I think we can then put these things together uh, good, uh, and say, if a work of art depicts something immoral, it's often appropriate to react with blame. And that reaction has perceptual components. It commands our attention interpretation. And when those components are ill-fitting, and especially when they take us away from the things that are the putative virtues of the work, that distraction makes for an aesthetic demerit. Uh, this, is, uh, this robust moderate moralism has the broadness of occluding uh, uh, moderate moralism because there's still no uh, dependence upon particular genre aims. Uh, so the question is, can I, uh, can I escape Jacobson's objection? So it's true, say, of the, uh, the visual collage. The collage might still be carefully curated and all the rest, uh, but that's a limited sense of fittingness. That's only looking at the elements. And limited sense fittingness, looking only at particular elements, is not all there is to aesthetics. Now what we've got is an aesthetically appropriate, aesthetic reaction to the artwork as a whole is a reaction which directs you away from the particular element. So this is aesthetic occlusion. So when Jacobson says, oh, this occlusion might be some other, you know, some other uh, uh, moral reaction or whatever, that's not aesthetic. Here I've said that this is aesthetic occlusion. So now, just in uh, maybe 30 seconds, uh, what should we then say about American Psycho? Because I want to say that it's uh, aesthetically vicious. Uh, and confession, I haven't read it, 
uh, and I haven't read it in part because the more I read about the uh, literature and aesthetic moralism, the more I think there's no good thing here. Either I'm going to think that's a good novel and then I'm a monster, or I'm going to read a bad novel. There's no, uh, so I haven't read it. So, you know, this might be slander. But as we read about Bateman's wrongs, we might get angry and disgusted by all the wrongdoing. We'll focus on the wrongs. In particular, that's going to make the novel about Patrick Bateman as a monster. And all of our attention on Patrick Bateman's wrongs and ills and viciousness is taking attention away from the broader parallels and systemic concerns about consumerism and capitalism. And that's what makes the book fail as a satire of those things, that the aesthetically appropriate aesthetic reaction to Bateman's wrongs distract you from that satire. Uh, I think I'm at my time. So uh, thanks so much. Uh, and I look forward to hearing uh, comments. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. We can do our clapping emojis or actual clapping. Um, I just want to remind people to write their questions in the chat, but I would also like to say that if you want to uh, write comments, you can as well. We'll be saving the chat and sending it to the speakers afterwards. So even if you have an example for them uh, that you don't really want to say during Q&A, type it in the chat and we'll make sure that the authors receive that later. Throw those questions into the chat. In the meantime, I'll ask my question since there's nothing else. Okay, so Craig, let me read out the question posed by Meskin. I wondered whether your argument makes sense of what I take to be the core moralist idea that the moral elements make for aesthetic demerits in virtue of their moral status. On your case, it seems that just so long as the moral elements fit well with the other perhaps immoral elements of a given work, there's no aesthetic demerit. So there's a sense in which immorality on your account isn't doing the work, it's poor fit that's doing the work. And that just doesn't seem to capture the, the moralist idea. Uh, good, thanks. So um, I think I have two thoughts. Uh, one is that, uh, or three thoughts. One is that I should just keep reading more about moralism to, you know, I have a sense of what the moralists are claiming. And the second related thought is maybe my concern isn't so much to find allies in aesthetic moralism as it is to defend the intuition that people who find American Psycho ugly because of its content uh, uh, are onto something. So maybe I'm more trying to capture those reactions than this space of theory. But those two kind of uh, thoughts that I should do more reading and, and, and here's my space to the side, I think uh, the moral badness is an impart, important part of the story, even if it's contingent. That it's because of the moral badness that blame is fitting, and the blame is what's making for the ultimate ill-fittingness. Now, still, what is ultimately driving the aesthetic vice is the ill-fittingness, but the explanation of that ill-fittingness involves uh, moral badness. And so here I contrast with, say, thinking about uh, um, uh, Triumph of the Will, where it seems that in many explanations of say, triumph of the will, the kind of vice, or the virtue, sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. So in triumph of the will, it's not necessarily the badness of Naziness that's affecting things. It's say the starkness, right? The, uh, the starkness of Nazi morality that fits. <coughs> so for me at least, it really is the badness that justifies the blame, that makes the blame fitting, that makes the ill fitting. But, uh, but I take the general point that I should think more about how this, whether this makes me allied or not with the kind of core moralists. Thanks. Um, question from Lex, and let me emphasize, if you want me to ask the question, right question. Could there be an aesthetically appropriate reaction to an immoral work that entails approving of the immoral aspects, which seems to suggest that immora immorality has an aesthetic value? Um, yes, so, uh, so here I think, you know, uh, if I think about a tragedy, a tragedy has a downfall and downfall is bad. Uh, and, and the downfall is certainly making the work better. So that th there's at least, it's certainly clear that, um, that elements within the work that are themselves grist for blame or disgust can make a work better. Otherwise tragedy wouldn't be coherent and scary movie, you know, all the rest of it. Uh, now, what about something like the uh, view espoused by the work as a whole? 
I think it's po like it's possible for me to imagine a very carefully constructed immoral work where say like a piece of shock work where the 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 artist intends to use the repulsion to their own work to their artistic aims so it's possible to capture that i think that uh uh so that's two ways in which i think yes the immoral can be an aesthetic virtue i think the first is certain and common the second is probably difficult and i just should think more about examples Okay, Laura and Elizabeth both wanted you to think about a kind of case. They might have to, they might want to give us other cases too. Um, what about something like Michael Haneke's film Funny Games, which is arguably designed to indict the viewer for their moral or immoral engagement in the aesthetic content of the film itself? Have any thoughts? Do you need, do you need more clarification from Laura? Uh, so let me try to summarize what I think the film is doing. It's something like the film presents some, I haven't seen it, some moral content, and then the audience reacts to it, but then the real point of the work is indicting the audience for their reaction somehow. Laura gives a thumbs up, Laura, unmute Laura, yes. Uh, effectively, I mean, the, 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 the short version here is that you are basically, as a viewer engaged in a sadistic spectacle, um, you are watching something rather horrible being done and it's it's often very off screen and very subtle but you keep watching you keep wanting to watch that's that's how it's designed to work and so the whole point is that by the end of this <clears throat> Hanukkah is quite deliberately trying to get you to to feel complicit in the wrongs you have been part of here um that's great uh uh this is another work of art that sounds fascinating, which I'm not sure I should actually engage with, given uh, what's just been described, meaning I should watch. But I'm right uh, there with you. I hate this movie. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> uh, and I suspect that something similar is actually what's going on with American Psycho. I mean, maybe not intentionally, but that like. Uh, so I think that that could still be a success on my story. Of course, it could be a success on other stories as well, but it could be a success on my story as long as the author or the, the filmmaker, Hanukkah, 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 as long as he was careful enough to give the viewer enough hooks to eventually realize the indictment. Like, I, I'm not gonna count it as a success if it's an indictment that no viewer can ever appreciate. So there's gotta be both the like blame of the content, but then also the kind of careful push to look at your own blame. Um, I don't know if that, I think that's internal okay. to the story I was telling. Thanks. I'm going to at least have to read about that. So Watch it. Jeanette just wants to, I take it Jeanette just wants to know how moderate you really are, Craig. Uh, are you, so um, how moderate is your moralism? Might you just be a moralist? Uh, well, so the, the moderateness is, and I think this goes back to the first question, uh, is that at least on this aspect of my robust moderate moralism, aesthetics sets its own standards. So I'm not claiming that like moral goodness is intrinsically beautiful. Uh, and so that's the, that's actually two, I guess, two aspects of modernness. One, aesthetics is setting its own standards. And two, uh, uh, because aesthetic sets its own standards, the morality, its effect on aesthetic virtue or vice is always indirect. Like it's always gonna be only by its effect on meeting those standards. So that's, that's I take it, uh, a significant kind of moderateness. And because of that indirectness, it's open. You know, I was just saying, I can imagine an immoral work of art that is because of its immorality and the disgust that it provokes, beautiful. I, can, I mean, maybe I can't imagine the particulars, but I can imagine the space for that. Uh, and so I suspect since I imagine the space for that, that's at least a little bit moderate. But I don't know, is, yeah, yeah. Okay, looks like we just, just fresh off the press, a question from Alex King. Some of the examples you've, you're giving seem in a way like Kripke's killer yellow case, where you might still think the thing is yellow, even if you can never successfully look at it. Do you agree with the thought that the thing is still yellow? Could we apply an analogous thought to your case so that the killer properties, in your case, the moral ones, don't actually affect whether or not we call the thing yellow? Uh, 
or beautiful uh, or tragic or scary. Right. Um, so, so I think that is, I think that's a way of repressing the Jacobson objection, saying something like, uh, just because you can't see it's yellow doesn't mean it's not yellow. Uh, and my response to the Jacobson objection is to say, it depends why I can't see that it is yellow. So imagine I have a yellow key and then I paint it entirely with black paint. In some sense, I can't see that it's yellow, but it, I guess it seems to me that that's because, you know, its insides are yellow, but it's not yellow anymore. Uh, and so my response here is to say, it's not just that the moral reaction keeps you from seeing the yellowness or whatever it is. It's that the moral reaction is an aesthetic reaction that is part of the aesthetic experience. So if the reactions are supposed to, if, if being yellow is to say something like the, the, the color experience, if you could get at it would be yellow, right? And, and just here, you can't get at it. But the color experience, if you could get at it, would be yellow. My response here is to say, look, the aesthetic experience, these moral reactions are not external interfering factors. They're part of the aesthetic story of the piece. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so, so that would be, I guess, how I would try to push back. But I'll have to look at that case. How are we on time, Elizabeth? Okay, any, any comments, questions for, ah, Elizabeth. Um, this might be more a question about blame, Elizabeth says. If I blame a director for say, being a child molester in real life, and I'm more attuned to see immoral attitudes embodied in their films, We've got cases. This blame seems to penetrate my interpretation of the film and impact your first premise. Is this an accurate interpretation of your argument? Uh, it's, uh, it pushes at uh, uh, an issue that I think threatened to eat up my entire talk. So in that case, what I want to say cheaply is something like, uh, it's true for you, the aesthetic experience, when you know about the, the director's flaws should now be, right, this, uh, this was terrible. But you're no longer saying the film was terrible. You're saying the film when knowing of the director was terrible. You know, the, the thing that's ugly has now changed. Um, you know, it's no longer just the film. Of course, now I have to explain how we pick out just the film, right? Um, but then uh, uh, just to signal the, the, the further thought, which started to make me uncomfortable, uh, I don't know if, if you guys have read the, I think it's called the Nickel Boys um, or, you know, any work of American fiction about race. And you might think that uh, uh, some reactions, it would be inappropriate for me as a say white Southerner to react in certain ways that it would be appropriate for someone who was not a white Southerner to react. So then it starts to look like features of me, the audience change when it's appropriate to blame, you know, when should I feel resentment as opposed to guilt. Uh, and that I just, it's one thing for me to say certain stand up comics are no longer funny once you know about their whole story. But then to say all of these works of art and all of their wrongs, whether I should blame and how I should blame is gonna turn on my own past, gets a lot more complicated. So that's throwing up my hands saying, interesting. Yes, I'll have to think a lot more. Okay, we might have time for one more question if anyone has it. What should we do about Buffy for many of us? Put aside that for now. I, it, I, I don't know the Buffy. Well, this is, I guess oh. this is the recommendation to read more. <laughs> oh, read more. Okay. Let's just thank Craig then for thank a great you. presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. All right. Elizabeth. Then I can uh, introduce our next speaker. So our, our next speaker is Jeanette Bicknell, who, if you don't already know, is the ASA, American Society for Aesthetics Ombudsperson, and also an independent scholar. Her talk today is The Crack in the Voice and Joe Turner's Blues. 
Hi, can you guys see my screen? Great. Okay. Thanks. Thank. Thanks. Thanks for um, having me, everyone, and looking forward to to chatting. So, okay, let's get started. So, my the problem in this paper is how to appreciate early African American folk music, given its morally troubling origins in slavery and post Civil War oppression. And the, the dangers I see inherent in, try, in appreciating uh, such material, uh, one is that we might, you know, minimize or rationalize the suffering that the creators of this um, art went through by talking about the redemptive power of art. That's one danger. Another possible danger I see is seeing the creators of this music as merely victims and having a patronizing or condescending attitude based on that. And uh, finally is the problem of appropriating the suffering of others via compassion. And this isn't something that I think has been talked about a lot in aesthetics. I'm drawing on the work of uh, Elizabeth Spellman. When I was a graduate student, um, her book Fruits of Sorrow made a big impression on me. So I'm kind of thinking, thinking back to that book. If you if you don't know it, it's uh, I, I highly recommend it. Okay, so rather than I, I, I decided to focus on one piece of music, one song, and we can see if it applies to to other works or not. So the song is uh, Joe Turner Blues. I picked it because it's one of the oldest um, uh, blues songs, one of the oldest African American songs. Uh, if ontology is your thing, we could you could have a whole debate about the ontology of the song because it exists in many different versions, different lyrics, different different tunes. And rather than, again, do a historical survey, I focused on the version in this uh, collection of CDs made in the 60s, made in like, I think he started around like 1962. It was a several year project of Harry Belafonte. Uh, it's called The Long Road to Freedom, an anthology of, of black music. It wasn't released until 2001. So again, you know, please seek it out if, if you don't know about it. The performance is by uh, Gloria Lynn and Herman Foster. And I'm gonna try and play it for you. Okay. They tell me. Can you hear it? Joe Turner, he done come. Oh, they tell me. Joe Turner, he done come. Come with Body links of change. They tell me Joe Turner come to town. He brought forty thousand links of change. And he's got one poor soul for everyone. There, I'll I'll just stop it there. So, um, if if you don't know, so what's who's Joe Turner? What's this song about? You you know, you may or may not know. Um, they historians believe it ref refers to. Of a Pete Turney, who was, I believe, the brother of the governor of, I think, Alabama. I can look up the details, but uh, he was, um, it's, it's essentially a song about mass incarceration because 
because they would go around to uh, black communities and arrest people on trumped up charges or very minor charges such as like illegal gambling or something like that uh, because they needed people to work in the, on, in the farms. So they would essentially steal black men from the community and make them work, sometimes work them to death on these farms. And the, the song is sung by a woman who, you know, her her man has been taken away by Joe Joe Turner. So it's a song about mass incarceration, and it's about mourning the loss and talking about the impact on the community. And it's also um, it, it's a it's a circumlocution, right? They don't say they say um, rather than saying how terrible everything is, it's like, well, Joe Turner's come to town, and everybody kind of knows what that means. So there's the song. And turning to uh, the philosophical part, um, the first person I discuss is Arlene Croce, who was a dance critic. And she wrote a very kind of notorious article in the New Yorker about uh, a work by Bill T. Jones, Modern Dance. And the work still here, it's about dealing with terminal illness and AIDS. And some of the performers were terminally ill. And Arlene Croce, uh, she wrote this um, uh, article here called uh, Discussing the Undiscussable, where she says, I'm not even going to go to this. I'm not even going to go to this performance. I'm just going to not go to it and write about why I'm not watching it. So and she writes about victim art, artists who present themselves as victims and martyrs rather than as artists. And she mentions Charlie Chaplin, sometimes Pina Bausch, the dancer, and maybe Robert Mapplethorpe. She's not super clear. But what she says is the problem with the victim art is that it arouses emotions of pity or despair, and then you can't have a proper critical engagement. So, she says, well, just don't, just don't look at it. Just don't watch it. Um, the other person I discuss, very, very different, is, is Fred Moten, the you know, African-American writer and, and theorist. In his book, In the Break, again, it's, it's quite a difficult book, but I've drawn out some, some themes, and I, I hope you would approve of me using them this way. He stresses the improvisatory nature of black performance. And he says it's improvisatory because it develops under conditions of oppression. And when you look at black art, he says the improvisatory surface offers something like sadness and something like devilish enjoyment. His central example is Billie Holiday. But I, I think this is also a useful way of looking at artists like the Nicholas Brothers and Cab Calloway. But that's another, that's another project. So sure, if you're looking at the Nicholas Brothers or Cab Calloway, it's, it's easy to see the enjoyment there. If you're looking at songs like Joe Turner's Blues, it's not evident, there's not a lot of evident joy there. So how to approach this work? So to take the problem a step farther, the art we take pleasure in would arguably not have been created, but for the oppression experienced by its creators. And so our appreciation is burdened with this knowledge. Well, one so possible solution that I'm gonna reject is a narrow conception of aesthetic experience. And I, and just like, just don't look at that stuff. Just, just be a formalist, just listen to the, just you know, listen to the work, don't, who cares how it was made? But I think a broad conception of aesthetic experience actually gives us a deeper understanding of works. And I think it's actually closer to what most people do. And I have an example here, um, Nicholas Walterstorff in Art Rethought uh, has a very nice discussion of work songs and it's, it's great that he discusses them. And he discusses you know, their origin. And of course, discussing work songs without discussing their origin would just be weird. He, Walter Storff notes that the songs were performed under duress. So that makes them kind of special to him. He says they hold particular value as manifestations of the human spirit. Yet Walter Storff says nothing about racial oppression in this context. And he's the source material he's looking at, which is the Alan Lomax 
prison recordings, I mean, the, the racial context there is, is obvious. And he, he mentions that sometimes the prisoners were forbidden from singing. And, you know, if he'd taken it a step farther and, and talked about how, you know, the black prisoners were forbidden by the white overseers from singing, that, that, that's like, that gives another dimension that would have been nice to have there. So I propose uh, three strategies when dealing with such, such works as, as uh, Joe Turner's Blues. Uh, the first one is to widen your focus and to consider works where joy is more readily available. And Albert Murray, the theorist of, of the blues, he says, don't confuse the blues as such, which is a psychological state from blues music. Blues music can be sad or it can be party music. It can be both. And you know, to understand it, you need to look at the whole kind of breadth of it. So, and in that um, collection I mentioned, The Long Road to Freedom, there's plenty of music that's, that's joyful too. Okay. Uh, the second is to educate oneself about the particular works and the social conditions of their origin. I'm just making a suggestion here to read um, Adam Gussow's Seems Like Murder Here, Southern Violence and the Blues Tradition, certainly opened my eyes and gave me a whole different perspective on some blues music. And finally, a hat tip to uh, Paul C. Taylor and Black is Beautiful. And in, in a way, I think this is the most um, interesting and fruitful suggestion is to pay really close attention to the performer's agency and the possible reasons for the choices they made. So in thinking about this particular recording, uh, both of these artists, the singer and the pianist, they could have, they, they didn't have to sing it this way. They could have done it very differently. So why did they sing it this way? Well, it's 1962 and maybe they're responding to things that are happening in 1962. So that's why they gave it a very respectful, kind of clear, almost classical treatment. Um, so just finally, my conclusion, um, the idea that some art has been created under conditions of immense personal and social suffering is not new. Uh, the suffering that sometimes goes to produce great art is not limited to the suffering of individual artists, which is I think how we usually take this problem. It can also be the suffering of many people whose names we will never know and whose distinctive stories we will never hear. Appreciation of the art they created or inspired should encompass recognition of that fact. Thank you. People should throw questions and comments in now. Uh, Craig, I'm going to go to Nathan first, just so that you clarify exactly what the question is. Nathan, how does the Nathan Wildman asks, how does the widen focus option help with appreciating particular songs like Joe Turner Blues? It seems to help with some songs, the happy ones, but not this particular one. I think it does help with the the this particular song as as well, because once you get it rather than looking at the song or you know a work in isolation, if I think looking at other songs, let's just say from the same period, uh, similar performers, I think it, I think you can kind of read back into, you know, that the original song. It, it's like, if I can put it like, if you're looking at like a, you know, a, a poet's work taking, taking into consideration their later poems can help you better understand their early poems. But this is the sort of suggestion. Um, I don't know that I can give you a knockdown argument for it, except to say, well, you just have to try it and see if it works for you. Okay, Nathan just follows up. Uh -huh. Quick question, would it be useful because it's broadly comparative? Is that the thought? Uh, 
Um, well, not necessarily. It could be very contrastive. I mean, okay. Um, I'm going to go to two thumbs up. So I think that means that was okay. <laughs> I'm going to go to Craig's question. So Craig says he likes the suggestion to educate. Wonder what he says. This says about aesthetic experience when you aren't in the full critical mode. He's thinking about sea shanties. These are work songs of a sort, right? But it'd be hard to do this kind of research into the one. Are there appropriate limited ways to engage with the work, even if you know, uh, even if you know you aren't doing the research or can't do the research? Well, it's interesting because Walter Storff mentions sea shanties as uh, work work songs, which they are. But um, what he doesn't mention there that this is work that is segregated by gender. It's, you know, ships just usually just had men on them as far as I know. And it's also work formed under work often performed under duress because people were tricked to get on to get on these ships. So I don't think every aesthetic encounter has to be one of, you know, deep research and you know, homework and, and extra reading. Of course, sometimes we just watch something to watch it or listen to it just to listen to it. But when you take an interest in, in uh, an art form, as many people do with the blues, then I think part of appreciating it is doing that, that homework. I'm going to go to Julie. The Croce example is much discussed in dance literature, but mainly because she reviewed a work she didn't actually experience. Many artworks have a theme of disease, sadness, tragedy, illness. But the critical critic typically sees her experience before writing about it. So, yeah. So, given that lots of artworks have these have these themes, what's particular? Can you just kind of specify what's going on in this this kind of these kind of cases? I don't think I understand. Well, let me just say briefly, I think you go, this takes you off on a tangent you don't need because the Croce example is notorious, believe me, we discuss it all the yeah. time, for the fact that she didn't see the work. Yeah. And there are plenty of other works that have sadness, disease, there are a lot of dance works about AIDS, etc. cetera, um, that that would focus you more. I, I mean, I immediately thought about the long, long discussion in dance literature. I think it's a tangent you don't need is I guess my point. Mm. Okay. Yeah. But I think, I think that it, I think it's a response though. I think people do have that response. Well, I'm just not going to listen to that or I'm just, just not going to yeah. watch that. I mean, Craig did that with American and Psycho, right? In our first talk here, he yeah. said, "Well, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna engage with the work." So I think, I think all I meant by the crotche, using the crotche, is to say, mm -hmm. "Yeah, that's a possible response to say I'm just not gonna engage with it." But yeah. Okay, let me turn to Jonathan Neufeld's question. When we broaden our focus, we often see that the production, sales, etc., of the music was entangled with exploitation, early blues in particular. Does this demand a different attention to the same song recorded as opposed to performed live in a non-musically exploitative context? Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, I think it does. I think, I think, I think it does. Yeah. Yeah, I think we think about them differently. Should. Okay. Um, Saul asks, I wasn't sure whether your prescriptions are intended to sidestep or work around the dangers you outlined in the beginning or indicate how they are not to worry about their trivial after all or something else. So I guess he's just asking you to clarify what your prescriptions exactly, how they're supposed to function. Um, they are, uh, they function as friendly advice if, if you're... There is, yeah, so they are, they are prescriptive in a, in a sense there. It, it's not meant to say these problems are trivial, although not every, I, I grant that not everybody thinks about them. And I, I don't know that everybody, sh should everyone think this way? I mean, I don't think it hurts to, uh, to, to make yourself aware of the kind of moral, um, 
I put it, the moral origins, the morally troubling origins of some work. I don't think it, um, uh, I don't want to be too prescriptive, but yeah, I think it bears thinking about, yeah. Le going back to Lex's question, um, Lex writes, I find it interesting that paper casts a proper aesthetic experience as a state of respect or reverence rather than a state of joy. Would you say that's a fair characterization? Um, for that song, I think respect or reverence. Um, listening to it, I certainly have respect for their musicianship. Um, I don't, when I watch the Nicholas Brothers, it's more a sense of awe, frankly, at, at how they push the physical limitations. Uh, I don't know that they're mutually exclusive, though. I think you can have joy together with respect. John Gibson um, says the following. I liked your three suggestions very much, but I worry that they aren't sufficiently radical given the social mm. conditions the song calls on us to acknowledge. Yeah. Isn't the listener who gets it thereby called on to become a certain kind of moral or political agent? confront the world in a certain way in addition to merely appreciating the song. That's that's a fair that's a fair comment, John. Yeah, that's that's fair. Yeah, I can think about that some more. Jennifer asks, do you think the musical structure of the blues, the repetition, the standard chord changes are a way of musically depicting or enclosing the impression? Yeah, I think especially in that version. Um, I only played the first two verses of it, but it it goes on and it builds. So musically it, it builds, it gets more intense as you, you can tell it's a little bit somewhat more intense between the first and the second as it goes on, it's getting more and more intense. And yeah, I do think that in a way mirrors the uh, more intense experiences that the song is talking about. Jeanette, I was going to um, make an observation uh, because I've had some thought about this in the context of hip hop, and particularly in hip hop that's sometimes described as nihilistic, dark hip hop that's sometimes described as nihilistic. I, it's related to your expanding sort of what you're looking at. One thing that seems clear to me is if you look at how people, fans engage with a lot of that music, they dance to it and play it in their cars loudly and rap along with it. And so you see elements of a kind of joyous engagement, with, even in this the so-called, so I don't know, Savage, 21 Savage, when he was first appeared on the scene, was described by some people as really nihilistic. And you guys can think of other hip hop artists like that. But, but, but the core fans seem to be really joyously engaging with that. And that seemed to me like a useful point, point so, us to something really useful about mm -hmm. this so-called nihilistic music. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because as, uh, as in some of the other songs on that album, there's a, a, a sort of song, Bull Weevil, about the bull weevil coming and eating the cotton. And it's, the lyrics are like, the bull weevil's like eating all the cotton and we're gonna be poor. But it's also kind of in a joyous way because like our white oppressors are going to be poor too because it's their cotton that's going to be eaten up as well. And similarly with some of the songs, um, a stag -a -lee, right? That that song he's sort of celebrating the the bad the bad man kind of joyously celebrating. So it's it's interesting to see like continuum of, of themes from that music to hip hop. Just uh, Jennifer mentions it's a large burden for the performers ah. too. Yeah, which I think is absolutely true. Yeah, and um, but I've written about that elsewhere. So this is about listeners. <laughs> I think we should just okay. thank Jeanette for a yeah, really thanks great, everyone. Great paper. Thanks very much. And our final speaker today is Alex Fisher from the University of Cambridge, whose talk is Truth in Interactive Fiction. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, can you all see my, my slides and hear me okay? Yeah. 
Brilliant. Okay. Um, so yeah, so as the title suggests, uh, I'll be talking to you today about truth in interactive fiction. So just to start off with, let's just briefly touch on just the notion of, of truth in fiction. So we have some sentences, um, like Sherlock Holmes, the detective, which are true in the fiction, you know, in, in a study in Scarlet, Holmes is in fact a detective, he's not a police officer, um, but it's false simpliciter. In, in the real world, you know, Holmes doesn't exist, so he isn't a detective. So what I'm interested in how this works in interactive fiction. So by interactive fiction, I mean things like video games, role-playing games, board games, uh, interactive films, and uh, choose your own adventure novels, these kinds of things. And something like the essence of interactive fiction is that the player can kind of influence the, the, the world's fictional truths. Uh, oh, brilliant. Uh, just looking at the chat. Uh, so you can make it fictionally true that P or that not P is. Some things in, in uh, interactive fiction are up to you. So in, uh, by contrast, in kind of linear fiction, let's call it, like uh, kind of a novel, uh, I can't influence any fictional truths. I can never change what's fictionally true in Pride and Prejudice. I can do whatever I like to the book, nothing changes. Um, and I think these kind of player choices give interactive fiction this kind of branching structure almost like a kind of probability tree, um, where each choice in the narrative kind of branches off in, in different directions. And I think we can kind of identify what I'm gonna call a branch of an interactive fiction is picking out just one of these kind of many possible paths um, through an interactive fiction from, from start to finish. So it took my PowerPoint skills to bring you this incredible diagram. Um, a, B, C, and D are all kind of individual branches of a, an interactive fiction. As you can see uh, at one point, uh, you know, the it, the, the narrative branches off in two directions, and each of these letters picks up one kind of possible fiction in, in the more general work. Um, so this is a very simple uh, interactive fiction. It's just got two choices, so you get four fictions. As you can imagine, for more complicated works it gets, you get many more individual fictions. And we'll come to that in, in a minute, uh, the aesthetics of that. So in a really interesting recent paper, Marissa Willis distinguishes between two uh, bearers of content in interactive fiction. Um, and so she, she says the work itself has some fictional content and individual branches have some fictional content. So some fictional truths are true in the work, uh, that Geralt's a witcher, you know, like that's, that's always true uh, in all branches, we might say. Uh, and others are only true in, in some branches, right? Um, and so some fictional truths are kind of relativized to, to branches. So we can call these kind of branch truths whilst work truths are true more generally in the work itself. And I think there are a few reasons to kind of make this distinction. I think it's a really useful distinction. Um, it's kind of intuitive in a way, you know, some aspects of interactive fiction are fixed, uh, others are up to the player. Um, and this can be quite interesting aesthetically by making things fixed, you can kind of evoke certain senses like inevitability of certain actions. Um, a second reason is I think we already distinguish between a kind of work and individual branches as, as aesthetic objects. Um, you know, we consider things like speed runs as aesthetic objects independent of the work itself. There might be a rubbish video game that has this amazing, beautiful speed run that's like brilliant to watch or something. Uh, I, I just want to say that like there's fictional content to each of these two objects. Um, so it, it's, it's not too radical. We already distinguish these things. I'm just saying each has fictional content. Uh, and in in uh, addition, I think a more kind of philosophical motivation is we can avoid this problem where interactive fiction looks like it might be impossible fiction by relativizing certain truths. So whilst it might be true that P in one branch and not P in another, isn't, there's no contradiction because you know they're, they're kind of true in separate domains. We can't kind of add them together to get a contradiction, which looks like a good thing. I don't want to say all interactive fiction's impossible fiction. That's weird. Uh, okay, so. When we think about aesthetic evaluation of interactive fiction, I think there's a, um, given that there's all these, all these branches, you know, choose your own adventure books contain hundreds of choices. So there's loads of thousands of branches. Video games contain even more choices sometimes. There's a choice as to, you know, do I move slightly left, slightly right? Do I jump? Like there's all kinds of choices, even very minor ones. There's so many different branches. Um, in linear fiction, such as novels, for example, there's only a single set of fictional truths. So it, how on earth are we supposed to aesthetically evaluate interactive fictions given there's so many different possible fictions they can display? You know, we can only experience a limited number of them. For video games, you know, some video games, maybe it's impossible to actually experience every single one. 
So how can we how can we aesthetically evaluate an interactive fiction? And so one way is that we can kind of compare our experiences. So you know I can talk to my friends about oh, what happened when you did this thing. So just in a, in a very crude example, let's say there's you know I don't know like a dragon guarding some treasure or something. If I choose to sneak past the dragon, it's quite interesting to hear well, what what happens if you instead fight the dragon. Um, and it can enhance my aesthetic appreciation to know how else things can go in the game. Um, and so some, some have argued that replaying a video game multiple times is required for a full aesthetic appreciation. We can definitely acquire a greater, though, perhaps not full aesthetic appreciation of a video game by playing just once and others kind of telling us things about what happens in these other branches. But I think something even more interesting is that in some cases, I don't even need to be told about how else things can go in interactive fiction. So, you know, while I decided to sneak past the dragon, I have some idea of how things would go if I fought the dragon. There's a kind of way for us to um, gain knowledge about what happens in other branches just on the basis of our own experience. And this goes some way towards answering the kind of puzzle I posed, which is how do we aesthetically evaluate interactive fictions on the basis of very limited experiences? So I want to say we can do this by assuming various fictional truths from the branches we have experienced. We assume they're still going to be true in other branches. So let's go through the, the mechanics of how I think this works. So uh, for linear fiction, uh, like novels, for example, or films, uh, Stacey Friend proposes that there's a, a reality assumption. So uh, this says that everything that's really true is fictionally the case unless it's excluded by the work. So, you know, uh, pigs cannot actually fly. So we assume that in any fiction, pigs cannot fly unless given reason to believe otherwise. Uh, one thing to note here is that this is an assumption. So this is not the kind of um, Waltonian or, or Lewisian reality principle, which says that things that are really true actually are definitely true in the fiction as well. And that's excluded. This is just an assumption that we make. So, you know, when we come to a, a fiction, this is kind of how we, what we think is going to be fictionally true. And so I want to say something similar goes on for interactive fiction across different branches. So I want to say we assume that what's true in one branch is true in another, unless we're given reason to think otherwise. So while in linear fiction, we kind of import, or we assume certain fictional uh, real truths are imported in interactive fiction, we kind of assume that certain fictional truths kind of hold across so I think truth in fiction clearly outstrips representation. Uh, it's, you know, it's fictionally true that Holmes has 10 toes. It's never explicitly stated. Similarly, in interactive fiction, there's a sense in which some things are taken to be fictionally true, even though they're never actually represented. And uh, I think this is in some cases because they're true in other branches. So here's another example. If we kill the dragon in our, in our um, dragon example again, we kill the dragon, the dragon reveals it has a sister, then we take it this fact that, that the dragon has a sister to be true in all branches, even in branches where we decide to just sneak past the dragon and we never kind of learn of this truth. Um, in some sense, just by experiencing the truth, we kind of once we assume it still holds in other branches. So let's call this the, the branching assumption everything that's true in branches we've experienced is true in other branches, unless it's excluded. And just to say a little bit about what it is to be excluded. So one obvious example is if it's contradicted. Uh, I don't think that's quite enough. Obviously some things, um, they're not explicitly contradicted, but they're obviously very unlikely to be true um, given what we know. So I think that's a, another way in which things can be excluded in, in different branches. Um, so we can make these inferences from one branch to another because when the narrative branches, we assume various propositions are still branch true in, in other branches. Um, and in fact, I think something quite similar happens for, for sequels. So it, it would be wrong to say there's just a rule, a flat rule that if something is said in you know, a work, then it's also definitely true in the sequel. You know, sometimes we have examples of, of unreliable narrators. Sometimes we think something's true, it turns out not to be, things like that. But I think similarly, there's an assumption that when we read the sequel, we assume that everything that was in the previous work is, is still true, basically. And I think something similar going on here uh, in interactive fiction across these, these branches. Okay, 
So now to the aesthetics of this. So whilst multiple playthroughs, or at least being told about these multiple playthroughs, uh, can give you a full aesthetic appreciation of a video game, in some cases, I think you don't even need to replay the game. Now, obviously, maybe there'll be some aspects like gameplay elements that uh, it'd be worth kind of replaying to experience in different ways, but the kind of fictional aspects, and so this comes more to uh, other forms of interactive fiction, let's say uh, interactive film or something where there's, there's limited kind of, there's not much gameplay, uh, not many gameplay elements that you are new on a different, in a different playthrough. In these cases, maybe one playthrough can even be enough because you can kind of guess what will happen if you choose differently. Um, we have some idea of what would happen if we chose otherwise because we assume that certain things are still going to be true in other branches. So I think this helps us to some extent resolve our earlier problem of, of aesthetically evaluating interactive fictions. I've forgotten the word there. Um, so that was the puzzle. How can we evaluate the whole work based on a limited number of playthroughs? Well, even though some video games branch drastically with many different choices and consequences, and a re reviewer can never experience every single branch, um, we can still get a good idea of how else things can go just by playing uh, a video game, for example, just once. Um, and so, you know, you might think that video game reviewers should you know, play, play a video game through a couple of times before they review it, but they don't have to experience every single possible branch. I mean, in some cases, as I said, perhaps it's physically impossible to actually do so. So I think this, to some extent, justifies the, the practices of reviewing on the basis of one, two, or maybe three playthroughs rather than going through every single, every single possible way that things can turn out. Now, I think this assumption gets some quite interesting results regarding, I think there's a, a kind of unique kind of dissonance that's enabled by this assumption. So there's a way in which more can change between different branches than you kind of assume should. Uh, and that this kind of dissonance is only really ever going to be noticed by playing through multiple times or discussing with someone else by kind of comparing two different branches. So if more or, or even less as well changes than we assume will, then this, this can almost be a kind of aesthetic fault presenting consequences that seem to outstrip the choice made. So let's just talk through a, an example of this. So in The Witcher 3, for example, the fate of, of one character, a main character, Siri, depends on the player's responses to five dialogue choices throughout the game. Now, these dialogue choices, when they're presented, seem very minor. Um, and so this aspect's been criticized because this is, you know, like a big deal. How does the fate of this important character end up? Well, it depends on just these, you know, five, uh, these five choices you make that don't really seem very impactful when they occur. So we assume that choosing slightly differently should not really affect that. We might expect some kind of small differences in, in if we choose differently, but not things as big as this, right? And so again, you know, when we re replay the game, we choose differently and Siri's fate is, is different. This presents a kind of dissonance as we feel our choices didn't really warrant these consequences. The consequences outstripped uh, our choices. Now, I think this can also happen the other way around as well. So the consequences of different choices do not differ enough in some cases. So we assume that certain fictional truths will be different in, in a branch in which we choose differently. And yet, in fact, they remain the same. So I'm kind of disappointed. It, does, it should be more different than it is given, given what we chose. In both of these cases, I think there's a kind of mismatch between what we assume will fi be fictionally true in other branches and what is in fact represented in those branches. I think other games as well can excel in, in they're very realistic in this sense. So um, the consequences that are presented are the ones that they seem like they actually fit the, fit the choices. So I've given a couple of examples. I think Life is Strange and, and Tildorn are really good at this. They, they convey how even very slightly different choices can result in very different outcomes, but they do that realistically. It, it's all believable. Um, so it can be an aesthetic virtue uh, when what we assume should change is actually what does change. So whilst linear fictions can be praised or criticized for the realism of their narratives, interactive fictions can be praised or criticized for the realism of their consequences. These are only revealed when you replay the game. So just to sum up what I've said, I think there are two bearers of content in interactive fiction, the work itself and branches. There's a problem. How do we aesthetically evaluate interactive fictions when there's so many different possible branches? I propose this branching assumption, which seems to help us with that problem. Because, and a consequence is that there's a unique form of narrative dissonance not found in linear fiction, where more changes than we assume should do. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Alex. Things got extremely interactive in there, so bear with me for a second. Okay, so there were a range of questions. Uh, I think um, Lex, Craig, Laura were all um, interested in whether uh, there was something distinctive about what you're calling interactive fictions and regular literary fictions. So I wanted to invite to speak on that. Maybe I'll start with Lex's, Lex's question. How does this differ from what literary studies do when interpreting fiction? Um, for example, we can make a bunch of arguments about the subtext in Jane Austen novels, which are making the case for what is true about a given thing in a no novel and changing what is true about it if they're agreed upon. Um, um, I'll go to Craig's also. Insofar as virtually all narrative works require a spectacular amount of gap filling, are all narrative works interactive fictions? So Huck Finn is a boy is a work truth, where Huck Finn is 5'8 is a branch truth. So in general, questions about how, about this category that you're carving, uh, that you call interactive fictions, and whether it isn't more expansive. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Yeah, so yeah, you definitely want to distinguish between certain fictions being kind of silent on certain issues, where like it's up to you know the viewer can or viewer or reader or whatever can imagine things how they want to. Let's say the height of of Huck Finn, right? But yeah, in 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 interactive fiction, it seems there's something different in that the player is kind of invited to invited to do that, and maybe they're given a certain. So I know there's a interesting paper by uh, by Nathan, who's in the audience, um, about they're kind of forced to choose one of a certain a few options, right? And maybe there's something something there to to what makes interactive fiction interactive and not these other fictions. But yeah, that's something I need to think more about, about what the distinction really is in those cases. Okay, Nathan had a question, which he answered, but we're going we're gonna to see um, what you think. So he asked originally, do you think there can be completely open interactive fictions, ones that don't have a tree structure, but are, are utterly open-ended? He mentioned, so there was, so one person mentioned Minecraft, but the cases that Nathan and I were thinking were, Tabletop open world RPGs. He mentioned D and D. I mentioned Apocalypse World. Um, is there a branching structure, tree structure in that, or is are they different? Do they work differently? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think another example of that might be kind of children's game of games of make believe, right? Like um, they could they can make up anything they want as as they go along, and that that seems similarly. There's all, all there are no kind of rules to it. Um, yeah, I think maybe, maybe that's something where things like video games is a kind of a set of what you could possibly do. Um, whereas maybe with something like D&D, &D, we really can, all, all bets are off, you can, you can say what you want is, is fictionally true. Um, that's interesting. I mean, I still, I don't see why that wouldn't preclude a branch structure, just maybe the branch, there are just even more branches, right? Because just this, anything goes. Um, but that's interesting, yeah. Nathan, since you had about seven questions or comments on this topic, do you want to follow up briefly? No, you're good. Okay. Uh, Matt Carlson asks, there seems to be a tension here. On the one hand, you argue we don't need to play through all the branches to aesthetically appreciate the work. On the other hand, it seems like we do need to play through all the branches to determine that and thus appreciate the realism of the consequences. For example, if we just guess what is likely to happen to Until Dawn, if we choose differently, then we won't really know that it exhibits realism of consequences. We'd just be guessing. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so maybe maybe you don't need to just play through once, maybe for each choice, if it's a binary choice, right? You need to play through each of those two ways. Yeah, okay, I see, I see the tension, absolutely. Yeah, that's something again. I, I think I need to I need to think more about that. But yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. So I think Julia, I I think there was a hand up, and now Julia, Julia, you want to get in here? It it was just sort of a follow up to the question that you and um, the, somebody else were asking. So I, as long as I'm not like okay, um, Go for it. 
I guess I was wondering if you have to distinguish not a, not only between truths of like sort of determinate worlds like video games or everything's kind of pre-programmed, all the branches are there or like um, those read through books and open worlds. But if you also have to distinguish between truths of like playthroughs and truths about the works. So one of the examples you gave was like, you know, a, a good speed run um, is like, I, I don't know, has some facts about it. I, an example might be like, you know, Mario in Mario 64, um, when my brother plays it is really fast and athletic. And then like Mario in Mario 64, when I play it is like sort of slow and, and rambly. Um, so those seem like really open possibilities. Like there's a ton of way people can play through a game versus like the truths that are already sort of built into the game. So like which, you know, dialogue box you choose or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's there's something to be said about like which which things count as as like part of the fictional truth. Do you, things about like the rules count, for example, are those those fictional truths? Um, but yeah, I mean, I also think like when it comes to things like speedruns, I think you need to count like all kinds of things as 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 kind of branching off. Like you need to count like you could make the same choices in a speed run, but just do it a lot slower. And you want to distinguish that as a distinct, distinct kind of branch. So you want to say like, if I perform this action, it took me a minute to do it. And it took this speed run like three seconds to do this thing. That's that's a different branch. But I, yeah, I think this all just says that there's just going to be so many different branches for, for um, especially video games where, and th this, this doesn't really occur with choose your own adventure novels, right? Because there's just kind of like, a, a more limited set of options. Madeline and Laura both mentioned fanfic. So let's uh, go to Madeline's question. Was fanfic's good to discuss? Taken all together, Madeline says, um, the work and a, its dossier of fan fiction resembles an interactive fiction. Can you evaluate in the same way? It seems like in that case, you explain back dissonance because you're dealing with multiple creators rather than one single creator. Hmm. So That's in general, how do you see the, to what extent does your account apply to the fan fiction case? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Cause it, it seems like it's interactive for the writer of the fan fiction, right? Cause they can, it, it kind of, they can edit certain things. Is that, is that the same? Is that the right thought? But the work in his dossier of fan fiction resembles interactive fiction in that things things branch off in different ways. Can you evaluate it in the same way? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think in in that case, yeah, you definitely get the way that like things kind of branch off. But I think in that case, there's less of a kind of connection between between the different branches, right? Um, you don't expect things from one fan fiction to hold or some things to, to hold true in the other one um, in the same way that maybe you do for um, like kind of singular works of, of interactive fiction. Um, all right, there are comments about canon and fanon, but we're going to move on to Nicholas Ryman's question. Might there not be a sense in which the work becomes aesthetically less interesting as a result of the closure you get from knowing everything about every branch? Perhaps in a similar sense that a non-interactive work might become less interesting when, once its open-ended aspects have been resolved or explained away. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely true. Like, I think it, it's, it's sometimes you can play through a game and it seems like the possibilities are, are endless, right? And then, or an interactive fiction in general. And then you go through it a second time, you think, actually, really, things didn't turn out that different. I tried to make it completely different and it stayed the same. So there's that kind of sense of openness and, and you know, maybe the best games do this as, as, as an illusion. You know, you make it look like, oh, everything's up to me. And in fact, it's, it's not. You choose differently and things end up the same. So, yeah, I, th I think there's definitely something to, be, something to be said for that. Hold on. Right. So I had a I had a comment that James Hamilton had a similar comment and he had a thought. So um, so I was just wondering whether the the claim that we take things to be true the um, the branching assumption is merely an empirical hypothesis. So it's an I take it it's an empirical hypothesis about how we engage with 
interactive works. So James thought it might be false. James, do you want to articulate why you think it might be false? Or do you want to say anything, Alex, in defense of the empirical hypothesis? I think I would like to hear him say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. I mean, it certainly seems true for some things, right? Like, I think in some examples, we absolutely, we experience something, we assume that that's going to hold true in, you know, when we, we decide, oh, I'm going to replay the game, and we expect things to still be true. I suppose that, that is, is the thought that they're going to be counter examples to this, or that it doesn't even hold in those more basic cases? James? Yeah, I was just thinking that if you if you make the assumption in playing a branch that uh, things are going to stay true unless it's ex explicitly excluded in the branch, um, you just may get things wrong. When you play another branch, you may be surprised. And wouldn't that be an interesting thing? Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's right. And definitely sometimes you are surprised. But I don't see how that tells against the thesis that you kind of initially assume that going in. I mean, sure, you can be wrong. But that's why it's an assumption, not a, a principle like, you know, um, the same with the same with the reality assumption rather than a reality principle. Well, it is it is right that it's an assumption that you might make. Uh, but do you need to make it? Hmm. I mean, I think it, yeah, maybe in some cases it can help make sense of, of certain certain things, even in, in the new branch, you know, you, you, you kind of carry over a certain amount of fictional truths and that helps you, I don't know, you kind of expect them to still be true and that helps you kind of interpret the world better or, or something. Um, but yeah, in, in some cases you, you definitely won't bring things over. Um, and I think it can be difficult to say which things you do bring over and which things you don't like. It, it, it's gotta be something like, you know, the things that you see, like some things seem like they should still be true and some things just don't and how to say which is which, I, I think that's that's quite difficult to, to say in some cases. I think that the, the, the concern I had is, I mean, it seems, of course it seems true that in some cases we make the make this assumption, but, I, but your claim seemed to be that we make this assumption when we engage with interactive fictions generally. Yeah. And I didn't quite see that the argument for the general claim. I was wondering, it, it kind of felt like it would be genre, dependent on the genre of interactive fiction that you're engaging with. Yeah, okay. So just out of interest, which genres do you think it would be more applicable to and which would it be less applicable to? It looks like, looks like mainstream video game interactive fiction might, might kind of support that you know people might approach mainstream video game narrative video games with that assumption but i just wasn't sure whether it was a general a general assumption that people made engaging with all interactive fictions yeah. so that i i don't have my counter examples i just have a question <laughs> about why to think why we should think it's a general assumption we make across all genres of interactive fiction yeah, I think that's fair. And I, I think maybe, maybe it should be more restricted to a subgenre. I mean, I think I still think that it won't just be video games. I, I, I feel like, um, like choose your own adventure novels. I think those are similar. Those are relevantly similar. I do think maybe when we get to other things, uh, board games, for example, or role playing games, maybe it's maybe it's less applicable in, in those kinds of cases. It's anything goes now. It's anything goes time. Um, just trying to see if I missed anything. If anyone thinks I've missed anything, shout out, shout it out. Nathan shouts out. When we think about true in one, what, when we think about true in one branch is true in another, unless given reasons to think otherwise. There might be problems where the interaction, ugh, sorry, there might be problems when we think of extraneous bits like getting all the feathers collect collectibles in Assassin's Creed 2. 
I sort of understand what he's talking about. Um, I'm not sure I do, sorry. <laughs> um, Nathan, could you possibly, possibly expand on that? Nathan? Yeah, so I guess what I was thinking of is there's going to be bits that are like not narratively important and not even kind of gameplay really important. They're going to just change completely peripheral, maybe display things. And those are only going to happen in certain branches and not in all. And I don't really see why we should imagine that they hold on all the branches, uh, even the ones where we don't have like counter evidence for completing them or anything like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think ultimately there's like a, a difficulty when, when we think about like which aspects should be like fictional as well. I mean, I wonder about those cases where the things like those are fictional. They almost seem like, I don't know, it's tough to say like, uh, is it fictional that you, you get these collectibles and stuff? I and mean, maybe in some cases it's kind of tied into the narrative, but in some cases it, it's kind of extraneous to it. But yeah. Um, I think we are going to have to end there. It's 4.08 and we said we'd be done by 4.05. We've got some extra comments and questions for you, uh, Alex, in the, in the chat, which is going to go, go to you. So thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Elizabeth? You're on mute. Thanks everyone for coming to the Southern Aesthetics Workshop and Aesthetics for Birds uh, collaboration. I hope we can bring these uh, to you again in the future. Uh, and thanks for everyone's questions.